I'll take the next one for now. Yep. So good morning, class. Welcome to our um, baptism class, the first one. Um, I know it's a little early, but uh, thank you for joining us. Um, let's have a word of prayer before we go into our class for today, okay? Uh, feel free to turn on your videos. It's going to be an interactive class. Um, you don't have to have all your makeup done or stuff done. It's okay. Yeah, <laughs> praise the Lord. Okay, all right. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you this morning. We give you all the thanks and all the glory and all the adoration. Father, we bless you because uh, this morning we are about to start our baptism classes. So we ask for you to guide us, to lead us, to teach us, to open our hearts to things that we need to know. Thank you, Lord, because, Lord, uh, we're not just hearers, but we're doers of your word. And speak to us clearly in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord, because all glory belongs to you. Amen. All praise belongs to you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, class. Um, I want to welcome, I think, um, Sister Bill has joined us and Fiji and um, Toby they joined us. So welcome. Hello. So welcome. And Caleb to welcome this morning. All right. So without wasting time, we're going to start our baptism classes. Uh, this is the first part. Next week, we'll continue uh, wherever we stopped today. All right. So I'll hand over to Pastor Lola Day. Do you want to go to the next slide? Yeah. Hi there, guys. Uh, can we please turn on our videos if we can? It would be nice to make eye contact with everyone. Yeah, so please, let's see your faces. Um, that would be great. And if you have any questions as we're going along, just, just uh, you can cut in and uh, I'll, uh, I'll be able to answer the questions. So for, the, for this first part, should be around 40 minutes, but we're going to be learning about the background to the practice of baptism and then the very unique episode of Jesus himself getting baptized by John and then we're going to talk about why why you know why do we need to be baptized so we'll talk about those three lessons today and then see how far we can go so let's go to the next slide so let's start with the with the word baptism where does it come from uh the Greek meaning baptizo is to dip when you dip something to overwhelm to plunge to submerge so it actually means to cause something to be dipped or to immerse something beneath the surface of water so the word baptizo which came from that Greek word baptize uh, baptize is the English version of it means you're being dipped into the water mm -hmm. you're being you know you go under and then you come back up, right? You don't stay under, you just go under and then come back up. But that process signifies something, represents something. Um, and we're gonna talk about what that represents uh, as we go on. But just to submit to you what the meaning of the word baptized, when somebody say, what does it mean to be baptized? It means you, you're submerged or you're dipped into water, amen. Amen. And then we said, what is the meaning of the word baptized? Christian baptism finds its origin in the command of Christ after his triumph and resurrection from the grave. So if you open your Bibles, look at that. But I have the scripture up there. Matthew chapter 28. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. This mm -hmm. is Jesus speaking to the disciples after he resurrected. He said, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So Jesus is saying, everyone that you call or make or convert to be a disciple, baptize them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says, is giving his full support or his full approval to the fact that when somebody becomes a Christian, the next step for them is to be baptized. And we also um, 
in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, it says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. That's another uh, scripture confirming the fact that when, you are bap- when you're baptized, when you believe and you're saved, you will be baptized. So there is like a progression. You give your life to Christ, you become saved, then you get baptized, which signifies something. I'm going to get there, but I don't want to jump the gun. But that process of getting saved and then getting baptized are very, very crucial parts of your Christian beliefs, of your Christian journey. And that's why we're here today, because some of us you know, may not have understood previously what's the, why is it necessary? Why, why do we do it? Is it religion? Is it culture? Is it, you know, some sects of the Christian faith? No, it's, it's Jesus himself ordained for us to be baptized and Jesus himself was baptized. And so he's made it a law for each and every one of us to be baptized. Amen. Amen. And then when we look at the next slide, Uh, what does baptism mean? You know, what does it mean to be baptized? So baptism existed before Jesus. If you remember, uh, maybe some of us may not know, but it was also a Jewish practice for people to be baptized. In fact, before you can be uh, accepted into the Jewish religion, you have to renounce whatever religion you had before and then you become baptized. You submerge yourself in the water, then you come out and then you become uh, a Jew. And a lot of other religions also practice baptism. They don't call it baptism, but they call it whatever else they call it. But it signifies to them that you become part of that particular uh, faith. And so before Jesus came, baptism already existed. It was part of the Jewish, Jewish faith. And Jesus himself was a Jew. And let us separate it from infant baptism. We're going to get there eventually, but it's very, very different. It's not the same thing. This is not what Jesus is asking us to do, to be baptized. or uh, You can be christened at birth, which means you're named and God, uh, you're, you're brought into the house of God and you're handed over to God. In that sense, you're dedicated to God as a child. And some churches might say, okay, it's baptism, but it's not the same thing. Uh, So baptism was used to cleanse and purify people. So like I said, what, what does it mean? When you go into that water, you're going with the full knowledge and understanding of what you're doing. And that's why this class is so important, so that we can bring understanding to you you're not doing a religious ceremony right it's a very very significant part of your christian faith and i'll i will share my my testimony my story of when i got baptized i'll share it as we get along but when you go in that water it's like you're being buried with christ the old you is being submerged but when you come up it signifies new life, new birth, a new way of thinking, a new way of living in the power of the Holy Ghost. So you're not doing it by your own effort anymore. You're saying, God, I, I died to myself and now I'm alive in Christ Jesus. And so that's why we call it a cleansing, a purifying. Sometimes baptism functioned as an initiation rite. So it's like I said, well, you're doing your own thing, going along. You encounter Christ, you give your life to Christ. The Bible says you've been pulled out of the kingdom of darkness. Now you have become a part of the kingdom of light. You're now a child of God. But what baptism does is recognize you as a child of God. The whole family of God can now welcome you and say, welcome into the family, welcome into the fold. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you, you get admission into university or college. The first thing you do is the... It's a welcome letter, get right? Yeah, no, but when you get on campus, they have like a... Orientation. Orientation. Welcome. Um, you know, 
saying, welcome to this college. Welcome to this university. You're now part of this community, right? Or even when presidents win election, before they can assume their office, they go through an inauguration. It's like an initiation, right? So for them to become president, they have that ceremony where they get sworn in, they, everybody's there, they welcome them into that office. The same way, baptism is like an initiation, right? Mm -hmm. Bringing you into the family of God, saying, welcome to the family of Christ. Welcome to the church of God. It's a passage, it's a rite of passage for every believer that I think we should not uh, miss out on. Do, uh, do you want to add something to it? Uh, no, 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 no. At this point, let's so keep going. sometimes baptism was a sign of internal cleansing. I've already talked about that repentance. So, if you're coming and saying, "Pastor, I want to be baptized," that means you've encountered Jesus and you've said, "Lord, I repent of my sins." How many of us have given our lives to Christ? If if we have not done that, then uh, baptism is not yet where you should be. But if you're giving your life to Christ, and we're going to go through that again to explain to each of us why we need to take that first step. But I believe that each and every one of us are giving our lives to Christ. But if we haven't, at the end of this uh, class, we will also present that opportunity to you again. Right. But it means that you're saying, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I repent and I reject the life of sin, right? Whatever it is that you were uh, doing before. Each of us, the Bible says we were all lost. We were all meant to be judged. But Christ came and he delivered us from the bondage of sin. We're all born into sin. It's not like one person is righteous and the other person is not. God says we're all sinners. But the only standard that can bring us to the place where we can say we're a child of God is the blood of Jesus. Right. And when we accept the finished work of Christ. So when you accept the finished work of Christ, saying that you know that Jesus came to save you, he gave his life for you, he died and he rose again. Mm -hmm. And you believe all those things. And you're now saying, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. That means you're repented. And the very, first, the very first thing that you, you experience is that newness of life. Correct. The, the Holy Spirit comes into you and you become a new person, a new experience, a new life. All, the old things have passed away. You, you no longer enjoy the things of sin. You now want to live for God. And the very next step, like I said, to that is being baptized. Because when you, when you get baptized... You, you, you die to your old self. And when you get out of that water and stand up, the rest of the church is cheering you on and saying, yes, you are now part of the family of God. And Christian baptism, the third, the fifth, the fifth uh, note I have there, Christian baptism is distinct from other baptism practices. I talked about that that some other religions, I know the Hindus have some type of ritual as well, and some other religions have, um, you know, the, what they call, you know, their own rituals of cleansing. But Christian baptism is the only one that says, you die with Christ, you buried with him, and then you're resurrected just as he was resurrected. Hallelujah. There, no, no other religion can claim that, that the, you know, that God is alive. A lot of them have worship images, they worship animals, they worship other deities, but Jesus is the only living God. The Bible says he's the only way to God. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through mm -hmm. Jesus. Right. And baptism is cementing your, your place in Christ, saying, Jesus, I am yours, you are mine. I've been baptized into the faith, baptized into... And it, it, it backs up what you believe. Because if you say, I believe this, then the baptism backs it up. It's like saying, 
I believe that, you know, this, uh, this chair will hold me up. Then you sit on the chair because you have confidence that this chair that you're sitting on is going to hold you up, right? The same thing, if you say, Jesus, I believe that you're my Lord and Savior, the next thing is to become baptized into that faith. Because the moment you get baptized into that faith, you are part of parcel of that faith. You'll become part of the, you, well, even when you come to the communion table, <clears throat> you are part and parcel of the whole body of Christ, everything that it entails. Because the body of Christ is, a, is you know, not the building, it's the people, it's the faith, it's the joy, it's the testimonies, it's the miracles, is the way of life, is the hope that Jesus is coming back again. Mm. Is is you know it's you living your your life to the fullest of the potential that God has given you, all the gifts and the callings that God has given to you, the anointing to be able to live a victorious life. When you come to God and you say, "I believe and I receive," baptism is the next logical step to verifying that you indeed believe that you are a child of God. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's look at a historical part of the, of the lesson. Jesus, this is the River Jordan in Israel where Jesus was baptized. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 3 from verse 1 to 6. I don't know if I... Matthew chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, let's, because I want us to read it together. If you have your Bible, can I have somebody read that? Somebody read Matthew chapter 3 from verse 1 to 6. And somebody else read Matthew chapter 3 from verse 13 to 17. If you have a Bible, just open it there. Let's read it together. So Matthew chapter 3 from verse 1 to 6. And then somebody else can read Matthew chapter 3 from verse 13 to 17. Yeah, you may have to unmute your mic. Let me see if I can do that for you guys. Um, mute. Um, see. Who's going to read for us? Matthew chapter 3 from verse 1 to 6. Everybody's quiet. Anybody? Caleb? Is Caleb unmuted? Caleb? Nobody wants to read this morning. Do we have our Bibles? Yeah. Faye, do you have your Bible? Faith. Yes. Uh, do you have your Bible? Um, what was the chapter? Uh, Matthew chapter 3 from verse 1 to 6. And then Caleb, you can read from 13 to 17. Just going to get up quickly. Um. One to six? Yes, yes, please. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel hair and the return girdle about his loins, and the meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region around about Jordan. 
Amen. Now, and verse 6. And were baptized of him and joined, confessing their sins. Amen. Go to verse 13 to 17. So then, uh, the same chapter, uh, 13 to 17. Yeah. Caleb, can you read uh, verse 13 to 17 from uh, the same chapter, Matthew chapter 3? Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to be baptized, baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus, Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then God, John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, "This is my Son, my love. With with him, I am well pleased." Amen. Amen. Thank you both. So it just gives us the account of when Jesus met John at the River Jordan. John was already baptizing so many other people for the forgiveness of their sins, calling people to repent and asking them to, to live a different life. So John was, was a prophet. He lived in the wilderness. The Bible described his clothing and the kind of food he ate. So he, believed, he, he belonged to a particular sect, but he was preaching about Jesus coming and telling people to prepare for Jesus coming and asking them to repent. And then Jesus walked up there and asked John to uh, baptize him. And John knew that this was the son of God. He knew that he had no sin. So for him, he couldn't understand why, why do you want to be baptized? You don't need to repent. You're holy, right? You're righteous. So why do you want to be baptized? Because like I said before, you come to baptism because you repented and you want to be cleansed. But Jesus said, I need to do this. Because for him, it was like signifying the beginning of his ministry, how he was going to go on and do the work that God had called him to do. And he needed to be baptized. It was like an opening of the door for him to enter into the work that God would have him do. And so he convinced John that, look, we have to do this because this is what God wants us to do. And I think it also signifies that he wanted to be, you know, the first of the body of Christ, the first, because he is the first and the last, right? He's the head of the church. He didn't want us to, to, to have to ask us to do something that he hadn't done. done. Right, right. And so he was willing, even though he didn't need it, but he wanted to do it. And the Bible says immediately, John consented to baptize him. He was baptized and the Holy Ghost, when he came out of that water, the Holy Ghost descended on him, which is the power of God. The Holy Ghost just represent the power of God. Rested upon him and God said, yes, this is my will and you're doing the right thing. God confirmed that he did mm. the right thing. Right, what a powerful moment. Um, but yeah, so I'm just looking at that picture of the Jordan and I'm just trying to picture Jesus in that water. And like you said, the word baptism is the word immersion. Um, and Jesus will never tell us to do anything that he hasn't done before. Right. Right. The Bible says he's the great shepherd. He leads by example. Uh, so if Jesus tells you to pray, it's because he's prayed and he prays. Told, if he tells us to fast, it's because he fasted while he was here. If he tells us to walk in love, whatever Jesus tells us to do is because he walked in our place. He walked on the earth mm -hmm. like as a human being. He came, experienced the highs and the lows of humanity. And here again, we see another example where Jesus is modeling for us Christian behavior. Mm -hmm. um, we're not doing it. People ask you, why do you want to get baptized? And one good answer is Jesus got baptized. And when he got baptized, before he left, he said, Make sure you baptize all of us too. And we see something profound happening here where after, as soon as he was baptized, according to this scripture in Matthew chapter six, in chapter three, 
The Bible says the, immediately the heavens were opened mm -hmm. and the Spirit of the Lord came on him as a dove. And God confirmed, actually God spoke, this is my son. And so we see a confirmation from heaven, from what, from that activity alone. And so I want you to, 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 uh, to embrace these lessons and this whole experience in faith and expect, expect that something will change in your life. We're not just trying to get you guys wet and get, try to get you into a pool. No, this is a spiritual exercise. Uh, Jesus said, go ye and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So this is a symbolic exercise. It's a spiritual exercise. It's a necessary exercise. It's part of your salvation experience. And like Pastor Lelade said, I'll hand, just hand over the, I'll hand it over back to her before. Um, she said, if you're not a Christian, you've not given your heart to Jesus, this is not the next step. This is for people who have surrendered their hearts to Christ, who have renounced their sins, who have accepted him as the Lord and their savior. So if you've done that, and I believe all of you have done that, then the next step is for you to be baptized, knowing that God has commanded it, knowing that when you do that, you align yourself with the family of God, knowing that when you do that, also, there are some things that happen in the spiritual. The Bible says the heavens were opened unto him and the spirit of the Lord came upon him. I strongly believe that the Holy Spirit moves, moves better. He does more work. He does a more effective work in Christians who have been baptized by immersion. Praise the Lord. I, I always wonder why the Holy Spirit didn't come to come upon Jesus before his baptism. It's, it's profound. As soon as he was baptized, the Bible says the Holy Spirit descended on him on a, as a dove, which means the Holy Spirit was waiting for that, for that activity to occur before he was baptized. And as soon as he was baptized, guess where he went to? He went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And that was the official start of his ministry on earth. So uh, I just want to encourage you guys, take this seriously. This is part of your Christian journey, part of your Christian walk. And as you do so, God bless you. Let's go on with the next slide. We're looking at our time because it's not supposed to be a long... Um... All right. So we said, why is the believer, uh, the believer to be baptized? Why, why, why? Why do you want to be baptized? Um, first point, because Jesus commanded it. If you look at Matthew chapter 28, I read that at the beginning. It mm -hmm. says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Can I just so at the moment... Here? Can I just quickly, sorry to interrupt you, Pastor yeah. Something you know, that was this translation I was looking at that says, instead of that, you said the word is, the word baptism means baptizo, which means to submerge, to immerse. And there was a translation that I looked at that says, go, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, immersing them, mm -hmm. immersing them in the name of the Father. Right. And of the Son and, and of the Holy, the Holy Ghost. Spirit. I want you to think of, think of something, everybody. I want you to pay attention. If you if you immerse yourself into something, you become part of that thing. Yeah. Listen to me. This is very important. When you immerse yourself, if you right now, if right now I'm 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 dry and I'm okay, if I walk into my pool with my clothes on, I become part of that water because I get soaked in the water. So even though I'm inside the water, I'm immersed in the water, I am already part of the water because the water becomes part of me. And what baptism does is, if you think about it that way, you're immersing yourself into God. Into you're immersing yourself into Christ. And then you're also immersing yourself into the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's a spiritual exercise. So you're not just getting wet. Once you go into that water, that's why it says immerse. It's not a sprinkling. Like people do. Some people say, well, yeah. you know, some churches, they just do a sprinkling. It says a baptism. That's not what Jesus meant. It's an immersion. When you're saying, God, I immerse myself into you. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. And you and God become one. Because if I'm in that pool, that part of the water of that pool becomes part of me. When I come out, I'm still wet. And I'm the, the water that I, that I have on my cloth, clothing is the water from the pool. And God is saying, as soon as you get baptized, become one with the Father. You become one with the Son. And you become one of, with the Holy Spirit. And you are, basically, basically, it means you are now partners and joint heirs. It's a significant exercise. And so this is why this is important. Okay, go on, Pastor Lodi. Amen. Amen. 
So it, like you said, it's a spiritual exercise, right? Mm -hmm. And Jesus commanded it. But you look at the second point. The apostles also commanded converts to be baptized. Let's look at Acts chapter 2 from 37 to 39. The book of Acts. I'm just going to open there. Acts chapter 2 from 37 to 39. She says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That was when Peter was preaching to the crowd after the Pentecost. Mm -hmm. And the crowd, Bible says, their hearts pricked them. They wanted to repent. And they asked Peter, what should we do? And Peter said, repent, in verse 38, and be baptized, yes. every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So Peter said, all right, you've come to the point where you know you need salvation. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Mm. And so there, there's that again, saying that the Holy Spirit is part of your Christian uh, faith. You cannot live a victorious Christian life without the Holy Spirit. You need him like the very air that you breathe. Mm. And it's so crucial that when you come to baptism, it's not 100% that you cannot be baptized in the Holy Spirit unless you've been baptized in water. There are people who were baptized in the Holy Spirit before they got baptized in water. And we're going to read some scriptures where that happened. But it is also very, that for me, my story was immediately I got baptized in water. I received the gift of the Holy Spirit. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'd given my life to Christ a couple of years before that. But when I decided to get baptized, and for, for, for you guys, you need to understand you're coming to this with a sense of, 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 you know, I don't know what word to use, but it's a very precious moment. It's a very, you know, very sacred moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, at that moment when you're going to be dipped in the water, it is such a precious moment that you will never forget for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Because you're coming and you're, you know that you're surrendering your life. Mm -hmm. You know that you're asking, and, and that's why it's so important that you understand why we're doing this. Right. You do, I don't want you to do it because mommy said to do it. I don't want you to do it because daddy said to do it. I want you to do it because you want to do it. You understand that this is no turning back. I belong to Jesus and he's Lord of my life. And there's nothing else but Jesus for me. And so when you come to that moment and we tell you, you know, you're going to be baptized. You will feel that weight of, of, of the presence of God. You will feel the, the presence of God. You will feel the Holy Spirit. You will feel just that spiritual experience that takes you up. And that's what Jesus felt. Bible says when he came, merely came out of the world, the, the heavens were opened. Absolutely. And the Holy Spirit descended on him like oh, a dove. <laughs> And so I, I pray that you will have such an experience. Amen. I pray that you will have such an encounter. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And it says in number three, number three point says, because Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness as an example to, to us. us. Caleb read verse 13 to 17. And there it says, Jesus came to John and said, we need to do this. And Jesus himself was baptized. And we said, if Jesus himself was baptized, you and I, also need to be baptized. Uh, number four. We're going to stop here today. Um, it's just going to take one or two questions once I'm done with this part. Or oh, I can ask you questions <laughs> if you don't have any questions for me. Hallelujah. So number four says, because we validate our faith by our obedience to the word of God. I told you that before, that you validate your faith people always say all talk and no action, right? Mm. This is like you're backing up your faith and saying, I actually believe that I'm a child of God. I believe I've given my life to Christ. So the next thing is for me to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. 
And when you baptize, when you get baptized, that's what you're saying. You're Absolutely. validating it. Absolutely. Right? So it's very important. It's like putting a stamp of authority on something. If you have a document or it's not signed, if you have a, a document or a check, you take a check to the bank and it's not signed. It's not validated. But once there's a signature on it, whoever has taken that check to get it cashed can deposit that check hmm. because the check has been signed. Right. And so baptism is similar. You're, you're validating your faith. You're validating what you believe. And so that's why it's important to do it. And you look at James chapter 2 there, verse 17. It says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. That's what I'm saying. So you back up your faith with action, and baptism is such an action. And then number five says, because Jesus closely connected baptism with the experience of salvation. Uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Mm -hmm. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Condemned Condemned to what? Condemned to damnation. Condemned to hell. Eternal damnation. Right? So, but when you believe, Bible says you become baptized Amen. Amen. So Jesus connected the two together. That it's a whole experience. It's like saying uh, you want ice cream, but you don't want to put it in a cup or a cone. How are you going to eat the ice cream? No. <laughs> no, you're making me want ice cream. Yeah. No. But if you go to the ice cream shop, they're going to ask you, do you want a cup or a cone? Right? It's a full experience when you have the ice cream in something. And so baptism is like a is like a the cup or the cone right the whole essence of your the salvation is key which is the ice cream but the cup of the cone is what makes it a full experience for you to be able to 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 enjoy that whole experience and so that's why it's key that jesus linked salvation and baptism as one whole experience okay we we have a question. Okay. Um, it's going to read it quickly. Question um, number five. Number five, sir. Is this part saying that if you are a believer but not baptized, you are not saved? Um, no. But he's saying that, let's read that verse again. Matthew 16, verse 16. Because there are lots of Christians who, who give their life to Christ, don't get baptized. Doesn't mean they're going to go to hell. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But the believe part is, is the salvation part. Correct. But the baptism, like we said, is val- validates in your salvation. Your salvation. Right. It validates right. your, your membership in the body of Correct. Christ. So I'm not saying that if you don't get baptized, you won't go to heaven. There are people who, even the, the, the thief at the side of Jesus, he gave his life right there. Before he died, right. He didn't get baptized. Right. You know, um, and if you look at that scripture again, Mark chapter, uh, chapter 16, verse 16, I want you to read it carefully. Now, listen to what it says Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Look at what he says next one. But whoever does not believe. So the belief is, is the, what? the belief is the key thing there, yeah. right? Baptized it is saying whoever, whoever, does not, whoever, does not be, uh, whoever is not baptized will be condemned. The key issue there is if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior. Remember that that um, the man, the jailer, who said, "Says what must my must what must I do to, to be, be saved?" saved. He said, "Believe in the Lord your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior." That's what he said. And that jailer didn't get baptized on that night. He didn't. But as soon as he said the sinner's prayer, he he got saved. Right. So salvation is in Christ, and your salvation, you're going to heaven. Your, your relationship with Jesus is based on the salvation experience. Right. You confessing your, your, confessing your sins and renouncing them and asking God to come into your life as your Lord right. and personal savior, savior. The baptism is just a validation, mm-hmm. a confirmation mm-hmm. of what you have done. Right. All right? It's not what gets you saved. Salvation is different, which is why you have to be saved first right. before you get baptized. There are many people who are baptized who think because they were baptized for some reason, they're going to heaven. No. The Bible says, whosoever name was not found written in the book of life is condemned. 
And how do you get your name into the book of life? By accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. What you're saying is, God, I have taken, I know I'm a sinner. I know I am wretched. I know that if I die today, I'm going to heaven because of my sin. But I also know that you took my place on the cross. And so I ask you into my life. And because you're now in my life, you've taken my place. You've taken my punishment. That's what salvation means, right? right. That's, exa- that's the core, core, um, the core uh, foundation of, of salvation. But baptism is the next step. It's not, so your baptism doesn't, get you to heaven no it's you believing in the lord jesus christ being saved that's what qualifies you to be with jesus and to go to heaven Amen. praise the lord uh any more questions i like that question thank you for asking that question anybody else i think i'm going to be tempted to give them a test after this well um did you do a test when you when you have baptism class? oh yes oh yes <laughs> Oh, yes. I don't think I was giving a, a, oh, yes. no. a paper test. Oh, I thought Pastor is serious about this one now. And Nicole know. raised her hand. All right, Nicole. Nicole, you want to go live and talk to us? You oh. have a question. Okay, good morning. Good morning, good morning Nicole. I have a question here. Um, sure. So if you were baptized previously um, in another church mm-hmm. um, and you want to become like a member of your um this church mm-hmm. do you have to get baptized again or what's the process um to become a member of the church oh good question so baptism as long what did you get baptized when you gave your life to christ or was it baptism yes. as an, okay yes so it's valid your baptism is a one-time experience right it doesn't matter where which church you did it at as long as you did it as an adult where you had right. full understanding of what you were doing uh it's recognized right. uh, anywhere you go but to be a member of nation's lighthouse church is uh just signifying that you want to become a member once you signify that you want to be a member we just include you in our membership roster uh, we, we initially used to do like a membership class. Uh, it's just we haven't done it for a while now. Yeah, yeah. But we, um, it, ideally, you, sh- you should go through like a one-week membership class where we uh, explain what the church stands for, what the vision and the mission of the church is. So we introduce you to, you know, what the church is about. And what we start, what we believe. What we believe, right. you know, right. you, how the tenets of the church and the practices of the church, like we believe in the Holy Spirit, we believe in communion, we believe in the unity of the body, we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he came and he died and he rose again, you know, we believe in the second coming of Christ. So some of those things, we explain them in the believer's class. But in the absence of that, you can still be called a member once we, uh, you signify that you want to be a member. You're welcomed into the body of Christ. Pastor prays over you and introduces you to the rest of the church. Uh, Sister Nicole is our newest member. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yay. And also, I have another question too. Sure. Um, what are the, well, I don't know if I should say position. Or what are like some available um, roles? Oh, like uh, ministries where you could serve. Yes, yes, um, ministry. That's the perfect word. Right. There. So that are uh, there, know that um, members can join or right. become a part of. Right. So we we have the children's department where people volunteer to teach the kids. We have the IT department where uh, Mr. Caleb is in charge of where we. Uh, the ones that control the media, the sound output, Bible verses, all those, anything that has to do with the technical part of the service. The, the IT department is in that department. We have the prayer department, which is, you know, people committing to pray for the church, pray for other members. Um, we also have, um, what, what do we call the... Hospitality? The hospitality department, like the benevolence department, where hospitality is kind of um, where you you serve the needs of the pastor you serve the needs of other uh, believers right 
and people like that who they they have a keen eye to see who has a need in the church and they find ways to meet those needs so you 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 find for instance if there's a sister who who needs something or who has a need you the benevolence department is supposed to identify that need and, and come to the pastors and say i know that there's a sister who has uh, a need is there a way we can help that sister so benevolence I, for me i love that department but you know it's not really been functional because we we're not we're still a small group mm -hmm. and so it's, it's hard to find people to fill all those positions um, and then of course you have the worship team and the choir um, which uh, is very also very important so every department is important so those are the core ones that we have right now so worship hospitality IT, uh, prayer, and children's department, okay. Sunday school department. Right. I mean, okay. usually I always encourage um, um, uh, members to, before they join any department, that they should prayerfully, you know, con uh, just prayerfully approach that decision. Um, if you get to a place where you think, God, I want to serve, you want to ask God, where would I be of maximum, um, maximum, uh, uh, you know usefulness um and, and that's important and you also want to show uh, you want to find places where you can be comfortable so for example if 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 you're not comfortable around kids and kids when kids start crying and they start making rockers you feel feel intimidated you shouldn't be coming to children's church it's as simple as that it may might say okay pastor i want to serve there but your natural dispos disposition is not towards children uh, so I just want you to if, if prayerfully consider, say, God, where, where can I serve? And what are the gifts and qualities that I have that, will, that would improve? That? What can I bring to, to the house of God I can use to serve God? And as you do that, the Lord will lead you. God bless you. And like as Pastor Lord already said, uh, even though we, we, we believe in baptism, that is not a, a, that's not a, re a prerequisite for joining our church. Uh, we welcome everybody from all nations, all tribes, all ethnicities. As we just love Jesus in our church. We preach the word of God. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Uh, we follow the precepts of the Bible. And, you know, and if you have more questions, you can always ask us or contact us directly. Um, so I think we have any more questions. I, we have a chat question here. Um, the question says, if one only accepts Jesus as the Lord and Savior with the goal of, of getting to heaven, while also ignoring everything, everything being a Christian entails, do they still qualify for salvation and be written in the book of life? Hmm. So, so you're asking if you need to do everything else. Yeah, he's saying that if, uh, if, you, if you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and the only reason you're doing that is because you want to go to heaven while also ignoring everything being a christian entails do they still qualify for salvation and being written in the book of life uh, it's hard to do that because you know why once you give your life to christ there's something happens on the inside of you mm -hmm. that makes you want to live a full christian life if you don't live a full Christian life, there's the, 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 the very risk there is that you fall away from the faith. You backslide. If you don't become part of a growing church family, you don't serve God in any capacity, you don't pray, you don't have the gift of the Holy Spirit, you don't uh, you know, do anything that Christians do, eventually you fall away. You're not gonna hold on to your faith it's just impossible because the, the biggest thing the enemy wants to do, the devil wants to do, is take your faith away. And he's going to work at it every single day. He's going to you know, buffet you with temptation. He's going to buffet you with the loss of the flesh and the loss of the eyes and things that would pull you away from the body of Christ. That's why Christians who don't, be, who don't belong to the body of Christ, they fall away. They can't maintain their faith. You can't do it by yourself. And so when you do the other things that Christ is asking us to do, Christ is not just asking us to be saved and then wander off. Mm. Christ wants you to be saved and become part. And that's why the baptism is key. He wants you to be saved and then become part of the family of God. He wants you to, to, to serve others. He wants you to 
give of your time and your talent. We talked about, you know, remember that story in the Bible where uh, God gave different talents to, to three different servants. And when he came back, he asked them, what did you do with what I gave you? <laughs> so they were all sons of God. That means they were all saved. But God was still asking them. Mm. So God is giving each of us a responsibility. Once you become a child of God, you have a responsibility to God to leave. The Bible says you were bought with a price. Jesus paid his blood for you. And so when you become a child of God, it's not just, oh, I'm going to do what I like. I'm just going to live my life. I've given my life to Christ and that's it. No. God says, okay, now you belong to me. And I'm going to place some demands on you. It's just like you belong to a family, right. right? You have your mother, you have your father, you belong to, you have your siblings. Do you live in a family and not do anything for that family? You don't help with clean up. You don't help with cooking. You don't help with, you don't have any expectations. You just get up and go every day. You know, you don't say good morning. You don't say good night. You don't, you don't know what your parents want from you. You don't know what your siblings want from you. Nobody lives like that. When you're in a family, you're part of that family. You know the expectations from that family. You know what your parents expect from you. You know what your siblings expect from you. You have a duty to your family. So the same thing when you become a child of God, you have a duty to the body of Christ. You have a duty to live for Christ. And doing all these things that we're talking about helps you to live for Christ. I think the other thing is, you know, and I'll show you that verse of scripture that you sh uh, you shared, where a lot of, and I, I see where he's coming from, where people might think, I'm going to accept Jesus as an insurance policy, so that when I die, I know I'm going to heaven at least. But you cannot expect to, to heaven is the end point, right? You're not, when you get saved, it's not, if God wanted us to go to heaven because he wanted us, if God wanted us, if the goal of salvation is just to get you to heaven, as soon as all of us get saved, we just leave this earth and we go and be with Jesus. Mm. But there's more to it. There's a Christian walk. God wants you to be an example to others. He wants you to live your life as an example. He wants you to use your life to preach the gospel to other people. Right. He wants to bless you while you're here, he right? He wants you to be a blessing also. And that demands relationship. So your being saved is, and going to heaven, some people think, oh, as long as I'm saved, then I'm, I'll be in heaven. Well, that's true. I mean, you're not going to lose your salvation unless you renounce it and actively say, I renounce my salvation, and you turn your back on God completely. But once you're saved, saved you're sealed with the seal of the Holy Ghost. But God expects you that while you're here, because he's not going to take you and, and take you to heaven as soon as you get saved. He wants you to say, let your light so shine before men and so god says i'm getting you saved because i want you to be an example to other people if you look at that um the scripture that we read in matthew 20 19 it says therefore let me let's go back there i'm just going to show, i know our time is far spent but i need i think this is important that's a great question he asks by the way mm -hmm. let's go back there i'm going to show us um a question here so we can find it um the first slide i think yeah, it says, therefore, I, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. It then says, baptizing them. Because God wants us to make disciples. It says, multiply yourselves. Right. Be, be an, a, 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 a multiplier. What you received. Change agent. Change agent. What you received, give to other people. Share with other people. It says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It does says, teaching them to obey. Mm -hmm. Teach them to obey everything, everything, everything I've, I've commanded, commanded you. you. Right. So it's a complete package. Your salvation, your baptism, your discipleship, your communion, your, communion, your teaching them to obey all things. It's a, it's a whole package. Yeah, it's so you cannot comp compartmentalize to your salvation and say, now I'm saved. Now let me start living like a devil again. You can't do that. You can't do that. And, and even if you try and do that, the Holy Spirit, the Holy convict Spirit you. will convict you. You, you will have no rest because the spirit that lives in you now is a different spirit. And so when you even go astray, you will find that you're not comfortable in sin. You'll find that every time you do something uncomfortable, the Holy Spirit will, will just be convicting you. That's wrong. You need to apologize. You need to repent. So you will not feel comfortable sinning like somebody who doesn't have Christ because you have a different spirit inside of you. Amen. So that's a great question. Thank you for asking that question. All right. All right. I okay. Know, I know.
Okay. I don't know if there is more time for another question. Okay, we can take one more. Okay. Um, okay, so following to the question that was asked earlier and the answer that you gave, right? So yeah. all right. Like as I said earlier, you know, having been, you know, water baptized before mm -hmm. and somehow maybe you have, you know, falter along the way. You know, maybe not a hundred percent, you know, doing all the things that, you know, the life of a Christian you're supposed right. to be doing. How right. do you account for, you know, the period in, in, in between which, you know, you were baptized, you know, along the way stuff happened. Mm -hmm. How is it is it a case where you fall in the category of being a backslider or I don't know. How do you account yeah, I, for that, I, I, that period in between? Mm, mm. Yeah. I mean, despite the fact that, you know, you still pray, you still, you know, read the Bible and, right. you know, you still hold yourself accountable for majority or, you know, most of what happened in between. What do you account that time period for? Do you become a backslider? And how do you recover from becoming a backslider back Amen. into being a Christian or a child of God? Amen. Um. You know, the Bible says we've been saved, but we're being transformed into the image of Christ, you know, daily. So Bible does not expect that you're perfect the moment you get saved. But Bible expects us to grow in the things of God as we as we come into contact with other believers, as we come in contact with God's word, we're supposed to be changed and transformed if we want the word of God to really make an impact in our lives. But like I said, the devil wants to steal your faith. He wants to, see, he's going to buffet you with things that, you know, you'll be like, why did I do that? You know, Paul said in Romans, he said, the things that I want to do, I don't do, right? And the things that I, that, that I should not be doing, that's those are the things I'm doing. So he even had that struggle in himself where he was frustrated that, he wants to live a full Christian life, but sometimes he falls short. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing when you fall short is to quickly come back, quickly run back to Jesus and say, Jesus, I fell short. I, I did this and I'm so sorry. Our heart, and that was what David did. David, he understood the power of repentance and of a heart that is so, you know, sensitive to God. A heart that is, so Bible says, don't have a heart of stone, have a heart of flesh, meaning that when you do something wrong, you know that, okay, God is going to be unhappy with me. And you run to God. You don't run away from God. You run to him and say, Jesus, I have sinned. Forgive me. Now, the question is, if you know that there's something in particular that is causing you to sin constantly, Bible says, if your left eye causes you to sin, cut it off. So if there's something in your life or someone in your life that what causes you to to fall. You want to separate yourself from things like that. Bible says flee every temptation. Flee. So run away from the things that cause you to fall. Run away from the things that cause you to sin. In that way, your repentance is genuine. Your repentance is, is real. And if it's something like an addiction, you want to say, God, break this yoke off of my life. Or you go to your pastor and say, God, I, pastor, I'm addicted to something. Please pray for me. And that the yoke of that thing will be broken off of your life so that you don't live in sin perpetually. Someone that lives in sin perpetually is actually a backslider. If you are living in sin and you, you don't feel like you need to repent and you don't repent, that person has backslidden from the faith. But even for people who are backslidden from the faith, if they come back to Christ and say, Lord, I, you know, some people walk away from God 10, 20 years, and then they come back. If God preserved their life while they were, <laughs> because nobody's promised tomorrow, right? Some people have been unfortunate. They died while they were backslidden. Those ones can't make it to heaven. But if, you, if you've come back from the place where you said, Lord, I lived in sin, even though I gave my life to Christ, mm -hmm. but now I repent and I come back, right. God restores you completely. It's like the prodigal son. Right. Right. I mean, if you, Nicole, do you have your Bible? If you, can you open to, just quickly, Second John chapter 2. 
Okay. Uh, first John chapter two. Okay. I want to show you something important there. And this is this also goes to everybody here. And and I know some of us have children, some of them, some of us don't have children, but you know how children have. Do you know how many times you have to correct a child? Don't okay, do that. Sure. Yeah, it's been there, right? Where you, it's like you it's like you're singing the same song every day. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't go there. Don't and you keep correcting them and you they say, okay, yes, mommy, I heard you. And then the next day they do the same thing, right? But what do we do? We keep correcting them. We keep bringing them back to the right path. Mm -hmm. Look at what John says in uh, First John chapter two, verse one. I'm going to read the NIV. He says, "My dear children." So he's speaking to us as children of God. Mm -hmm. Children, right? Keep in mind what I just said about how children behave. He says, mm -hmm. "I write you. I write this to you, so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father." Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So he's saying that, look, God understands that we are children. He understands that from time to time, we will make mistakes. He understands from time to time, we will, we will do with the, what the stubborn knucklehead things that children do. That thing that you said don't go to, that place that you said don't go to, that's where they will go, right? But he said, he said so don't sin. But he said, if you sin, remember, God sees you as a child. He sees you as his child. And just as you have compassion over your child, that you're not going to throw the child. You know what? That's your third warning. I don't want you anymore in my life. You just throw the child out of the house. You can't do that. You keep correcting the child because you love the child. And most times, eventually, the child will get it. Right? right? That's the same way God looks at us. He understands that we are children. He understands that we'll make mistakes. We'll fall out of, of fellowship with him. We'll do our own thing. We'll forget to pray. We'll, we'll do all kinds of things that will grieve his heart. But he says, he says that, says, even if we sin, we have an advocate. The word advocate there is, is the word for somebody like a lawyer, a mediator. Jesus is the one always going to the Father saying, look at Nicole, look at Pastor Abby, look at Pastor Lola. I know they've done this. This, this is like the hundredth time he's doing it this month. And every time he says he's sorry, he keeps doing it. But Lord, forgive them. And so you have that assurance. Not that we should consciously walk in sin, but when we find ourselves falling from time to time, God has, has made provision for that. He knows we're going to do that. And that's why Jesus is our advocate, is our, is our intercessor, is our mediator, is the one who speaks on our behalf, Amen. which is why your salvation experience is so fantastic. That's, and that goes back to the question uh, that was asked initially that we just, do we get saved because we want to go to heaven? Your salvation is needed here, right. where even as you walk in another, you're not, when you get saved, you're not perfect. Your, your external environment doesn't change. And we still fall into sin. But because now we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we belong to the family of God. Now, all of a sudden, even when we sin and when we fall short, God is always ready yeah. to take us back. Yeah. All we have to do is, God, you know what? I know I said I won't do this anymore, but I've done it again. Lord, will you forgive me? And he says, yes, I will forgive you. Yeah. So I don't want us to think that, oh, we're backsliding and we can't go back to God. You've never gone too far for God. You've never gone too far for God. God says, it doesn't matter how far you've gone, you'll always have a home with Amen. him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. That was an exciting, um, Thank you. exciting um, 